we are back. Thank you for joining us for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. We're joined now by Joe Bannister, who really is a hero because he has courage. And in a world where courage is such a rare uh, quantity, it's even more precious. He was a, a Treasury agent, armed agent, criminal investigator, assigned to the IRS. And I'll get him to recap his story, but to make a long story short, because it's important because it's about other people's awakenings that have since happened or people that find out the truth and decide to just go along with the system. And so that's really the story of life. Are you going to stand up for what's right or are you going to just go along with the system? Are you going to just follow orders? But he heard a talk radio host with a guest on exposing the IRS as a collection agency for the Federal Reserve, that the Federal Reserve was private, New World Order. Well, he thought, you know what, I'm going to disprove this because he liked the radio show. He listened to it routinely, and he was going to contact the show and show them the error of their ways. Well, he found out that the guests and the hosts were not lying, and then that led him into all of the different adventures, some of which could have put him underneath the jail. Uh, Joe Bannister joins us, and you'll also see under him his website uh, where you can get some of the key reports that he's written to give to your friends and family so they can understand exactly what this multi-armed, tentacled creature is. Um, and, of course, we're talking about the IRS. So, Joe, it is great to have you here with us. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, start at the beginning and then run right through the, the trial, how they tried to imprison you, and then I, I, I want to get into some of the things that are currently happening uh, in the world and get your take on that. Very well. Well, uh, thank you again for having me. Um, basically, I, I graduated from college in 1986 from San Jose State University and uh, got an accounting degree and moved into the accounting profession. And after a few years in the accounting profession, uh, I looked at what I was doing and what my boss was doing. And I thought, there's no way that I can do this kind of accounting work for another you know, 30 years. I need something a little more exciting. Yet I didn't want to abandon my skills, uh, financial and tax and accounting skills. So I looked around at my friends and, and even many family members, and a number of them were in law enforcement, mostly local and state law enforcement. But I had at least one friend who was in federal law enforcement. He actually worked for the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. And he had friends who worked in the FBI. And so through talking with them, I, of course, I got very excited uh, that they said, oh, the FBI loves to get their hands on CPAs and attorneys to become special agents. Uh, and I think they'd really like your qualifications. And so my Bob, who ended up becoming my boss years later at the IRS, put me in touch with these various FBI agents. And so I did pursue an application with the Federal Bureau of Investigation back in the early 90s. And I also, as a backup, uh, plan, submitted an application to the IRS Criminal Investigation Division. Now, at that time, of course, my heart was set on the FBI because at least prior to Waco and those kinds of things, the FBI had a reputation. They had TV shows about them, and you know, everybody thought it was really cool to be an FBI agent, but there weren't that many great TV shows or um, uh, public support for the IRS, so I wasn't that thrilled with the IRS option. So I pursued the FBI full blast and actually qualified to be sent to Quantico, Virginia. But there in the early 90s, there was a hiring freeze at the FBI, which ended up meaning that they couldn't actually hire me and send me to Quantico, Virginia. Well, in the meantime, while I was waiting, the IRS Criminal Investigation Division called me and asked me if I'd be interested in a position at the San Francisco office. I grew up in San Jose, California, about 50 miles to the south of San Francisco. And given that the FBI couldn't hire me and I did want to get into law enforcement, my, my friend, Bob Garini, said, hey, you know, go ahead and, and interview and see what happens. Well, the IRS did, in fact, extend me an offer. And it was November of 1993 when I was sworn in as an IRS special agent. And just for the listeners' information, uh, you know, there are all kinds of, as they're affectionately called, alphabet soup agencies. Uh, well, the IRS uh, is no exception. They have a criminal investigation division component, and it is staffed by about 3,000 special agents or criminal investigators. 
And those special agents are this are looked at the same in the federal government as an FBI agent or a Secret Service agent. The designation is GS-1811. So I became a GS-1811 in November of 1993. And that's basically under Treasury, isn't it? It was at that time. Of course, now everything's changing around and everything's becoming under the Department of Homeland Security. But uh, IRS uh, was and still is under the Treasury umbrella. So uh, I was hired in November of 1993, and I expected, of course, my brothers by that time were in uh, local and state law enforcement. Uh, at this point, you know, my brothers are a battalion chief in a fire department, a lieutenant in the state, in the state patrol, and a police officer in, in San Jose. So they all got the jobs and intended to spend a full 30-year career there. Uh, I only had to spend 20 years to fulfill a full career span in the IRS, and I intended to do so. I got in when I was about 30, and uh, that was my expectation. But about two years into, I'm sorry, about three years into my career at the IRS, uh, I was, as you said, very, you really described it perfectly. I was listening to a talk radio show. Uh, the host was a gentleman named Jeff Metcalf, and his guest was D.V. Kidd. Uh, she's still around and beating the drum for us all. And D.B. Kidd was talking about the income tax, the Federal Reserve, uh, the New World Order. She didn't really get into a lot on the radio, but uh, she got into enough about the income tax that it really got me because I thought either I'm a terrible investigator because this host and this guest now have fooled me or there's something to this message. But I really couldn't accept either one of those because – the first one would hurt my ego that I wasn't a good investigator and people could fool me very easily. And the second one was that the, uh, the career that I had put my uh, life into and really the income tax system I had wrapped my entire professional life around uh, was somehow there was something wrong with it. I mean, legally wrong and morally wrong. And so I, I decided to look into these claims that DV Kid made on the radio that day. And that was in uh, December of 1996, about three years into my career. And so I got some booklets that DV Kid offered. She was only offering them for a buck a piece, so she wasn't making any money off of them. But they're about 40 or 50 pages a piece. Uh, one was called Blind Loyalty, and the other was called uh, Why a Bankrupt America. And she spoke about or wrote about the Federal Reserve and the income tax and uh, New World Order and all these kinds of things. And what I found interesting about her books is that they were very well, not only very well researched, but they were very well backed up. She would actually list the names and addresses and in some cases telephone numbers of some of the people that were making these claims about the income tax. And so one day I just thought, you know what, I, I need to find these things out and I'm going to call these people directly. And, uh, you know, this wasn't some kind of a, it wasn't a, a sanctioned IRS investigation. It was a, a human being, an American, someone who thought that he was doing the right thing, using his financial skills to uh, protect his country. And then hearing someone say, no, that's not what you're doing for those people. So I really felt uh, you know, an ethical, moral need to find out what was going on, not to mention a duty. So uh, I did start to call some of these people that were listed in DV Kids booklets. And to you know, just shorten the story a great deal, I spent about two years while I went to work every day as an IRS special agent. Uh, on evenings and weekends, I would continue to dig and dig and dig and document and research and investigate to determine if these claims that DV Kid made about the reach and authority of the IRS and the federal income tax laws, if they were true. And my expectation was that if she, if it was not true, that I would, of course, expose her and the host, Jeff Metcalf, as liars. Uh, and I really didn't uh, contemplate the other alternative, <laughs> that they were actually telling the truth and what I would do about that. But after that two-year period of evenings and weekends, um, I came to the conclusion that, at least a preliminary inclusion, conclusion, that indeed uh, they pointed to a lot of facts and evidence that I couldn't poke holes into. And uh, it was so factual and so um, strong that I, I felt a compelling need to, uh, you know, I had a duty to speak up about what I had found. Uh, and I knew, of course, I wasn't so blind to think that uh, this couldn't have caused harm to my career and my, my family and things. 
But again, that sense of duty, the fact that I took an oath uh, on the first day of my, of my job to support and defend the Constitution, and I was always mindful of that oath as I uh, did my duties as an IRS special agent, that I felt I really had no choice but to at least speak up and question my supervisors and my peers at the IRS about what I had found. And I was humble enough to uh, basically let them know that, hey, if I've made a mistake somewhere, please just tell me. And, you know, you can uh, give me 20 lashes and uh, I'll just have to tuck my tw tail between my legs and, you know, wish I had never done it. So you but came in humbly and said, hey, these folks are saying this. Can you answer these questions? Tell people what happened next. Well, I decided that it might be best to put together some of the highlights of my investigation into some kind of a report, because as you know, any criminal investigator has to put together a report that's reviewed by their superiors and the, you know, the prosecutor to determine if someone should be prosecuted. So I'm, I was used to preparing reports, so I prepared a report of some of the highlights of the information that I had encountered. And I pr produced that report and, and gave it to my immediate supervisor. If you remember me talking about Bob Guarini, that friend from many years earlier, he ended up becoming my boss at the IRS in the San Jose, California uh, CID office. So I had to give my report to Bob, the very guy who wanted me to get a job as an IRS special agent. And I asked him to forward that report uh, and, and transmit a letter up the chain of command uh, up to and including the commissioner. Uh, because, again, I, I felt a duty. In fact, the commissioner at the time, Commissioner Rosati, he issued a memorandum to all employees in the IRS telling them that if they ever encountered fraud, waste, or abuse, that they should report it immediately. So I was really just doing my duty and following IRS policy. Of course, I knew the message wouldn't go over too well, but still, they had the same duty. They took the same oath that I did, and I expected that even grudgingly so – that they would uh, do something about it. But what they decided to do was to issue me a short memorandum that stated that they would not be responding to any of my questions and that they would provide me with the paperwork necessary to tender my resignation. And they immediately took my firearm and told me that I was to be placed on administrative leave. And uh, they, sent, they sent me home, they took my office key away, and I was supposed to go home for a week and think about what my next move would be. So they didn't fire me, but they certainly encouraged me to resign and flat out told me in writing that they were not going to address any of my concerns. Now, Joe, how did they just show you the door? Well, they put together a, a brief memorandum, and I, I understood from my chief, um, they call them special agents in charge now, but he actually told me that my report and my request for review went all the way up to the assistant commissioner for criminal investigation back in Washington, D.C. The only person higher than that gentleman is the commissioner himself. So that's how high up my request went. And yet when the uh, answer came back down the chain of command, I was told in a memorandum, which is available you know, on my website, people can look at it, uh, where my chief told me, we're not going to be responding to your concerns, and we will provide you with the paperwork necessary to tender your resignation, and we're immediately placing you on administrative leave for one week, and you're to stay on call, but you're not, you know, you're, you're not to come into this office, and you're supposed to stay at home and be on call. So in America, asking questions about the law was something that they basically told you you weren't welcome there. Absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that I was adhering to my oath to support and defend the Constitution. As I mentioned earlier, I actually received a memorandum in my inbox, just like every other IRS agent, that I was supposed to report any indications of fraud, waste, or abuse. And so I did exactly what the IRS instructed me to do. And then the response was, we're not going to address any of these concerns, and there's the door. Wow. Now... It's been a long time since we first met in the late 90s when I was there covering Operation Urban Warrior, a big military takeover drill, and happened to also get in touch with you because you'd been um, on the cover of a, was it Annie Scheister or was it? Uh, it was Media Bypass. Media Bypass, that's right. Uh, so I, I remember going and meeting with you. And since then, you've obviously learned a lot more. So just in summation, 
as you know, a former criminal investigator for the Treasury Department assigned to the IRS, badge gun, raiding people, the whole nine yards. You go do a criminal investigation. You discover, hey, you know, all is not well here. We didn't get this till 1913, same year as we got the Federal Reserve Act. It, it, it wasn't used on most Americans till the 50s, as you know. So how do we build a country without this? And, then, and why was it unconstitutional before, but now it's supposedly okay? Um, I, mean, I mean, I think I'm answering my question for me. I actually want your answer about now with all your knowledge, the CPA knowledge, the criminal investigator knowledge, you know, trying to ferret this out exactly how does the IRS get away with this? How does it tie into the Federal Reserve? Now they're announcing carbon taxes when you fly on an airplane that are paid to private consortiums. You know, we see this model expanding in Europe. They have Goldman Sachs uh, controlled presidents and prime ministers in multiple countries. They raise the taxes and now pay the money directly to the banks. So now I see things getting even more extreme, not just a quasi, you know, federal slash private Federal Reserve and pay your taxes into the Treasury and then it goes to the uh, Federal Reserve, and it's all these swaps and things. Now it's becoming 100% transparent, and The Economist magazine brags, hey, um, Goldman Sachs conquered Europe. I mean, it's the same thing here. How transparent will it have to get? I and mean, that's another question, until the servants of this system realize this is illegitimate. So, so, so let's go back and tackle that you know, statement slash question there. In summation, what is the IRS? What's its relationship? Well, I think uh, you point out an interesting um, aspect of my looking into this. I, I, I saw uh, basically a tentacle and had no idea how big the octopus is. Uh, you know, that the IRS and the federal income tax is, is just one of many tentacles that is tied into the, the monetary system in America. But then, of course, the monetary system throughout the world, and then who runs that monetary system, and who implemented it, and who, you know, who decided that the federal income tax and the Federal Reserve would have to come into being at the same time in 1913, realizing that that was no coincidence whatsoever. That that one, they're married, they're joined at the hip. They they have to function together, and so uh, you know, learning that the as they say, you know, the, the rabbit hole, just how deep it goes. And I know you, you've lived that same kind of life where you, you think that the rabbit hole has gone deep enough and then there's just a whole nother, you know, thousand feet uh, to, to traverse down. So uh, bottom line for, for me and all of my research is, number one, I don't encourage people to take on the IRS. Uh, you know, I encourage people to educate themselves and understand the landscape. OK, because you've got to do that first before you do anything different at all, if you do anything different at all. Um, but other than that, as, as far as the IRS, um, their, their authority, basically their authority is much more limited than they lead the American public to believe. Uh, most Americans who work in America and live in America aren't liable to pay the federal income tax. And because there's an absence of a liability to pay the federal income tax, then according to the law, it's very clear there, they have no obligation to keep records. They have no obligation to file returns because those obligations come after you've been made liable for the tax. And that liability for the, the average American just isn't there. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I, I don't like to call the income tax unconstitutional because I don't believe that it's unconstitutional. I think what has happened is the uh, the Congress and the Treasury Department formulated a way that they could basically fool the public into believing that they had an obligation to pay the federal income tax. And they used the existing statutes that did apply to certain Americans in certain limited circumstances. For example, if you're an American that works abroad, okay, you work over in Europe for some reason, then there could be tax provisions, income tax provisions that would actually apply to you and make you force you to pay the federal income tax. Or a person who comes here to work but retains their citizenship outside the United States. That would be another example of a framework and a scenario where someone might have to pay the federal income tax. So there are statutes in there that apply to some people. 
but through the media and through the government and you know the Congress, everyone, the uh, judiciary, everyone keeping silent and a wink and a nod, um, the IRS is able to operate as if everyone is required to pay, and no one holds them accountable, or very, very rarely are they held accountable. So they, the IRS does what their job is, which is to just you know slash and burn <laughs> and take as much property as they can and get away with as much as they can. And because the American people, uh, largely the time period before the Internet, are just unaware of this, that this is even true, and then even if they find out it's true, well, then, of course, they're called kooks and, you know, knuckle-dragging mountain dwellers and militia members and racists. And there's all this, this little program that's ready for you if the veil is lifted off and you actually understand the truth. So the, the depth of the conspiracy, shall we say, or the depth of the, uh, this mechanism is, is huge. It's gargantuan. And I would encourage people, try to get an idea of just how big this monster is before you go jousting with it. Well, so many examples of this color of law thing pop into my mind while you were speaking. But all over the United States, there is no law that you've got to take vaccines to attend school, college, any of it. But they announce it's the law, and then they'll trick you. They'll, they'll, they'll kick you out of school for not taking the shot because of policy, but then they trigger criminally truancy laws because you're out of school, even though it's not applicable to same in all 50 states because they kicked you out. But even if you were able to get to a jury trial because it's family court and there aren't juries in most cases, still it, it's so complex that people don't understand it. The police arresting truants even though they were kicked out by the school for not taking shots, they don't even understand it. And it's that model of where something is a fraud. I, I always researched, why does the system love these? Well, it's because they know the loopholes and they're exempting themselves. Most uh, of the big corporations and really you know, powerful rich people pay almost no tax. Uh, Mitt Romney, on record, pays almost no tax. His wife almost pays no tax. Um, you've got the Rockefellers and Rothschilds put their money in tax-free foundations and then, and then only spend part of the profit on philanthropic operations that is actually stirring society. And the example just goes on and on and on and on and on where it is a fraud. Uh, and, and they know exactly what they're doing on, in, in, in so many cases. And you know, as you pointed out, though, then it gets to where it's institutionalized. And then that's why I don't recommend people say, you wimp, tell people not to pay it. Listen, I know for a fact my dad overpays the taxes. They've got him as a mark. They've, sh they've shaken him down three times in my life. Uh, and I've watched it. I know for a fact, you know, there's not just the whole debate uh, about how the government and I want you to speak to this, you know, has this fraudulent income tax or, or this fraudulently applied expanded income tax. What about the way they take stuff without due process? What about the shaking down people? What about in this economy where companies can't stay open and, and, and they just keep squeezing and squeezing or how they're getting rid of the write-offs? I mean, I've seen the reports, even the Wall Street Journal, where they've gotten rid of almost all the investigators for people worth hundreds of millions or billions, and now they have the few investigators that are there, a few thousand, as you mentioned, who are actually busy messing, not even with middle class I've seen now, but they put them on, quote, blue collar groups. So, so the rich, they've set this up. They're getting the tax money through corporate welfare, and they're sicking the IRS on middle class and poor people, and the IRS isn't even allowed to go after them, except for an occasional movie star to create fear. I mean, it's, it's so mafia-driven. I know I'm ranting here, but, I mean, uh, your take on that. Uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. I mean, uh, they, w what is really the most sinister to me is the, the bullying-type nature. I mean, here they want all these anti-bullying laws. I wish they would apply them to the IRS and the EPA and all these federal agencies that are bullying good Americans. And the reason they, they bully that particular group, you know, middle or lower income people, is because they can't fight back. 
and you were you were talking earlier uh, in one of your shows about the the shorter gentleman, the shorter police officer who was banging your head against the wall. I mean, it, you know, who do they think they are? Uh, but of course, when they can bully people and they get away with it, well, then they figure, you know, if I can bully one guy, I'm now tomorrow I'm going to bully two, and then I'm going to bully five, and then I'm going to bully twenty. And it's this track record of being able to lie to people and get away with it that gives them the impetus to continue lying because it works and it's up to us and that's why i'm so grateful for all all that you do and all you know all of your crew uh is because these lies work because people don't even realize that they're lies and i think that's the first step and and why you do such a great job in exposing these lies and giving the platform to people like myself who are trying to stay alive and you know pull the arrows out of our back uh, as we expose the lies in a particular uh, walk of life that we come from. Joe, since you raised that point, and if people can learn more at your website that we've been posting underneath you uh, off and on, tell us about your court case and this particular exhibit 04-035 AF, uh, because uh, for those that just joined us or, or, or don't know, you know about your whole history, uh, they actually tried to prosecute you. Well, well, they did prosecute you and tried to put you in prison uh, for engaging in uh, what your college degree is in, CPA work, simply trying to help people with their taxes and, and using uh, what's in the IRS uh, rules. Well, basically, after I left the IRS in 1999, uh, I reluctantly would help people with their IRS issues, and ma mainly because the place kind of gave me the willies after I left. I really didn't want a whole lot to do with it. But, you know, carrying a gun and a badge for the IRS, and people think you, you know everything there is to know about the tax laws. And so I, you know, got up to speed in, in order to help people. Uh, but this particular client, for when this in this case I was prosecuted for, he had already paid income taxes for, for three particular years, and he wanted to ask for his money back. And it just so happens that that's what the IRS has encouraged people to do for decades, is if you have a problem with the income tax, pay the money first and then sue for a refund. Well, that's exactly what he wanted to do, and that is exactly what this client asked me to help him with, was to know what the IRS rule book said and apply those rules exactly to his request for a refund. And that's how I got involved with this client. And of course, I mean, as, as was found out in my trial, I'm a very meticulous, I mean, I'm an accountant, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I dot my I's and cross my T's. And so we followed the IRS rule book to the letter in order to seek a refund of previously paid income taxes. And it was that process, that request that became the uh, foundation for the allegations against me. The government, the um, IRS, accused me of conspiring to defraud the United States of America by asking for the money back and by preparing three false amended tax returns for this client. And so that those were the allegations. And of course, thankfully, we still have some rights left. And I had a right to a jury trial. As you pointed out, it's rare. Uh, in this day and age, with all the administrative state that's come up around us, to get 12 of your peers to actually evaluate your conduct. But I did have that opportunity, and thankfully, they were paying attention and awake, and they could see that the government had no case. The U.S. Department of Justice that was the prosecutors, they had no case. Uh, they claimed in the indictment that I had prepared three false federal income tax returns, but during testimony, none of their experts could point out a single false item or line in the tax returns that I had prepared. The special agent who investigated me was directly asked if he had seen any evidence of a conspiracy between me and the client, and he said no. So the jury, uh, you know, I talked to the jurors later after the verdict, and the jury was saying to me, I mean, they... Joe, what we couldn't understand is why they were making the they the government was the prosecution was making you look so good. And I said, well, they were using a lot of my work papers, the very documents that I put together to ask for this refund, and I did everything by the book. I, I was a CPA at the time, and I was just trying to advocate for my client and follow the IRS rule book. And for that, I was indicted, and they tried to put me in prison and silence and discredit me. 
Thankfully, the jury was listening and paying attention, and they saw that there was absolutely no evidence of any wrongdoing, and I was acquitted of all four charges. Wow. And, you know, now we read about big corporations not paying taxes, but then they argue, well, but our, our executives pay taxes. But you look at that, on average, they pay less than 10 percent. They've The ultra rich have written this. They created the income tax to control this country. You know, it's in the Communist Manifesto and it's 10 planks, Joe, as you know, to have an income tax. Uh, this is the opposite of the American system. And, and, and as Ron Paul and others yourself expose the IRS and the, and, and the private Federal Reserve. Now over 90% of Americans in polls know that it, it's private and a fraud. So the, you know, they've gone from just saying, oh, you're racist if you say the Federal Reserve's private or the income tax is a fraud. Well, now that doesn't work anymore. So what's the next phase then? Because as we're seeing, the more taxes we pay, the poorer we get. Uh, you know, Kennedy cut the income tax by close to 50 percent, tax receipts doubled. But look at California passing carbon taxes now, which is further killing your economy. They're not stupid. They know what they're doing. They want to shut down the society so they can consolidate it. So, so, so where do you see this going as people wake up on one end, but also as a tyranny uh, tries to uh, stomp that liberty back down to the ground? I'm extremely concerned because, uh, as I'm sure you've recognized, I've heard you say it on your show, uh, we're, we're in a sprint uh, with the, the enemy to the finish line. And uh, that sprint, I mean, it's as fast as we can run and as fast as they can run. They're, they're running with the tyranny and the sword and the boot on our necks, and we're running with the truth and trying to educate as many people as we can. Uh, and I, I'm not sure who's going to reach there first, but if you look at history, and of course those excellent documentaries where you point out how many hundreds of millions of people have been executed, killed, uh, tortured by government. Government is the uh, entity that we need to watch out for. Uh, neither you nor I advocate that we don't have any government, but that we recognize that, as you've pointed out, government is a... Um, you know, about the, the servant, it's, uh, you really have to watch that servant very carefully. And uh, I just, we all need to redouble our efforts to educate eat our neighbors, even if they look at us like we have two heads. Uh, that even happens to me. You know, of course, when I show them my picture of what I used to do, uh, they, they kind of shrink back and they, it kind of shuts them up. So I know most people don't have a picture like that to show around. But nevertheless, keep trying uh, keep praying, of course, because uh, God can do amazing things in opening people's eyes. Uh, even those that are on the other side, the dark side, uh, their eyes can be open. So we need to continue to pray for that. Uh, but we just we can't give up. T t I agree with you. Tell me about this particular exhibit from the trial, though. Uh, it's an email here, uh, and and we're going to put it on screen here uh, in just a moment. But Joe, uh, t tell us about this. Well, the. The, the document was fascinating in the sense that I only learned about it uh, a few minutes before this gentleman, Tom DeLeonardo, who you can see at the, to at the top of the email. That's his, uh, the person who sent the email. But the nutshell of the story is that when about two years after I resigned from the IRS, I bumped into this Tom DeLeonardo at the IRS building, like at the foyer down at the bottom of the, you know, on the street, basically. And he said to me, it's really a shame that you've, decided to hang around with all these greedy people. And of course, I was very you know, taken aback that he would accuse me of being greedy and hanging around with greedy people. So I said to him, Tom, look, you used to work with me, and I, I hope you see that I have, I had integrity at least back when we used to work together. Can't you, who actually works for the Department of Justice, arrange for me to have a meeting with someone, someone who can address these questions and concerns I have, and then I can share those questions and concerns and the answers with the rest of, the, of America, and we can get rid of this. I mean, if, if I'm wrong or I'm doing bad things for our country, expose me. But I'm sincere. You used to work with me. You know I'm sincere. Well, it turns out, Alex, that Tom went back to his office back in D.C., and not but a few days after he met with me, he wrote an email to his boss, Ronald Semino. And Ronald Semino still works for the U.S. Department of Justice, but he's been promoted. He's now, I believe, a deputy attorney general under Eric Holder. 
And Samino got this email, and as you can see in here, uh, if you're able to point some of those things out on the screen, uh, he does point out that he claims that my associates are mostly notorious illegal tax protesters who would most assuredly be disruptive and uncooperative. uncooperative. But Tom also says about me that he spent many hours working with me and that he believes that I would listen to the Department of Justice Tax Division. So this email was given to us, the defense, just a few minutes before Tom testified in my trial. And what this email points out is that even when a Department of Justice trial attorney asks his boss, who was in charge of, of enforcement of the income tax prosecutions for the entire Western United States, and he asked that boss for a response and telling him that I'm a sincere person, the response he got was nothing. Ronald Semino did not even respond to this email. So that goes to show not only that I was sincere in trying to get answers all the way back in 2001, but someone who worked in the Department of Justice and put through a request up his chain of command was ignored as well. So the jury could see that Bannister has tried through every possible channel to get answers that would, you know, um, contradict his findings, and no one's come up with, with anything. No one's, no one's tried to talk with him or do anything. No, this and shows, I mean, when you're in the right, you're going to show somebody the law. You're going to answer the questions instead of calling people kooks or nuts, uh, just like they'd call us kooks and nuts for saying the Federal Reserve was private. It doesn't work anymore. So here you are, you see him, and he's like, oh, Joe, you hang out with greedy people because he's, you know, morally mad that you're making him think. And you come exactly. back with, hey, why don't you, you know, you know, I'm a real person. We were friends. Why don't you then just have them please answer my question? Maybe you can get some results here. Maybe you can have them show me this and I'll, I'll be happy. And, and he goes and tries to find out and he can't because, exactly. because it's all a fraud. In fact, here's the ultimate example right here. And I want your take on this because I've studied this in depth. It's the end of World War II. America totally trusts the government for the first time. Because uh, we're the good guys. We just beat the Nazis, so we must be perfect. And, and, and the government's our mommy. It's our daddy. It's our big brother. And so they take the income tax that wasn't used, but for maybe one you know, point at the top percent, and, and, and then that was only a few points. You know, sounded reasonable. Now they expand it out. But something else happened after World War II. They started the double set of books, the Comprehensive Annual Financial Reports, which then shuffles off over 70% of the money on average of county, city, state, federal, you name it, to these offshore banks for, quote, investments. And they also came to all the churches through the big denominations and said, you do get your First Amendment exemption from taxation and regulation because Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof as the First Amendment begins. Then the press and the right to assemble and re redress of grievances. But the first part is religion. And they came to him and they said, just sign this quick, easy form. It's, there's not even a filing fee and you get your tax exemption. So they got them to opt in, but the trick was they became a charitable organization under U.S. code and regulatory systems. So that's how the trick works. And that's what the IRS is. That's what all of this is. I mean, I've read the federal cases of trucks were starting to get on the new highways people paid for, and we're tearing them up. And they said, those are heavy trucks. They're making money, they're commercial. Make them pay more, they're using your road. Then they used that, began to tell people, okay, well, it's the end of World War II. Get a little paper ID, not even with your picture on it, just to prove your car's been checked out and that, you know, you're paying for the road, even though your gas tax is already paying for it. And then now it expands out to everything. This is how they did the IRS. This is how they got the churches into 501c3, now controlling what they could politically can do. When before, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. They trick you into saying, I'm applicable as somebody working in Puerto Rico or Guam. I'm applicable as, as a charity now. I'm no longer a church. I'm a commercial driver. And it's all lawyer fraud. And once you get it, that's all they do because it's done by color of law. It's not even really unconstitutional because as you said, it's all fraud. They trick you into the contractual agreement but now it's been done by custom so long, even if you figure this out, 
the police, the investigators, they don't know. They were like you before. They really think you're a kook. And, and, and so the juries think it too in most cases, you're going to jail. It doesn't matter that they're sending preachers to jail who aren't 501c3. And it says Congress shall make no law respecting a re establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And until the 50s, no, this didn't even exist. It's all this fraud, but the big kicker is, is that they do it not just because it's fraud and, and a trick, but because the elite know it, and then you learn they all use the loopholes and are exempt, and they're still living under the Constitution. I mean, it's masterful. It really is masterful. It is, and it, it's all a coordinated effort, as you know, you've documented over and over again. And that's, you know, of course, what was disappointing to me was I thought it, I was disappointed enough to see that it was such a scam going on with the federal income tax, but to see that it was just one tentacle of a humongous octopus uh, was was disappointing on the one hand, but it also made me rely more on my faith and realize that you know, God knows what's going on, and we need to just to pray and and be on the side of good and uh, expose the evil and make sure we're not doing, we're not having part in it um, because it is a huge monster that's out there, but we shouldn't feel intimidated because together we can do amazing things. And of course, with God's help, his guidance, uh, his inspiration, uh, we can do great things. So um, I think there's, I have plenty of encouragement. I don't want people to think I'm discouraged. Uh, you know, been through a few uh, harrowing experiences for sure, and I may be through some more in the future. But the bottom line is, as, as this email points out, uh, when you when you are an honorable person and you're a good example, uh, pe the, the the government and these these tyrants uh, they come up short, and they, their dirty tricks don't always work. Well, that's right. Um, now, they've really tried to persecute other IRS agents and, and uh, not so much Treasury people that have been honorable, but, but they are really scared of people that work for the system like Saul of Tarsus waking up. I mean, that shows that's an Achilles heel. And a lot of people are like, well, then why should I, you know, if you're a cop or a federal agent you know, out there watching, why should you then? Uh, you know, stand up to this or, or, or send us documents or things like that? Because Corruption doesn't just stop at one point historically. It always keeps moving. And I try to explain this to people that corruption can be right here. But then as soon as corruption's allowed, even more corrupt people get in and push the barrier back until pretty soon everything's fair game. And here's an article out of the Daily Mail today. And it's a headline Mitt Romney's wife had blind trust invested in Goldman Sachs sex trafficking fund. And this is kidnapped women, children, you name it. UN's heavily involved. Anybody doesn't believe us, just search UN sex trade, UN child kidnapping. I mean, it's in the millions over a decade. I mean, it's so huge. They've got cruise ships that have got sex slaves on them, folks, that the Clintons have been connected to. World Net Daily's on reports. And this stuff is so crazy. Like DynCor here in Austin caught running uh, child kidnapping rings worldwide, and then, and then they run the private CPS groups uh, here in Texas. And I tell police on the street, and they just laugh at me because it sounds so crazy. Hey, police, you see that building? That's the biggest sex traffickers in the world. And the cops just laugh at me because, it, because it's like, yeah, right, buddy. They just don't get it. But here's the Daily Mail. It's also in the Associated Press. And it's not about her blind trust with Goldman Sachs. I'm not even saying you know, Mitt Romney's wife's bad. My point is this is so mainline. The question shouldn't be why does she have a blind trust invested in Goldman Sachs sex trafficking fund? Why are there mutual fund investments on sex traffic, not just, not just uh, uh, you, you know, women who are above 18, and that's all enslavement anyways with drugs and the rest of it, but 15-year-old girls and younger. I mean... It's so mainline. I've seen the congressional hearings where Congresswoman McKinney brings up, hey, DynCorp's trafficking little girls and boys. Here's the documents. And Rumsfeld says, well, we put them in a penalty box and didn't give them any contracts in Bosnia and Herzegovina for a year as their punishment. And then she goes, no, you didn't. And he goes, oh, let Dr. Chu, the head of the Pentagon budget at the time, and Chu's like, well, we're just allowed to do that. And then they go after her and, and get her. I mean, it's just like I'm living in the twilight zone here again. Why is it that Mitt Romney's wife's invested in this? The question is, why does Goldman Sachs have a slave sex trafficking fund? I mean, look, look I've got another one right here for, for people. This is why I'm freaking out. Bloomberg banks financing Mexico gangs admitted in Wells Fargo deal. 
in a two-year period, $378.4 billion in drug money. I mean, and they didn't get, they paid a 1.3% fine on this. I mean, this, this is what I'm saying. If we know this, Joe, what else is going on? How much further is it going to go? This is, this is like ridiculous. This is what makes third world countries collapse, is that people just let corruption run rampant, and finally, everything just collapses. The reason America's had all this prosperity is we weren't perfect, but we had the most liberty and were the most upstanding people when it came to business, and we didn't put up with out-of-control corruption. That's why we have this country. And, and people don't get this. It, it, as we lose our liberty and our morals, all the prosperity goes out the window. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you're exactly right. That it, it really comes down to our individual morals and our own ethical, you know, our, our own codes of conduct. And if we're going to, because we want a higher dividend payment, invest in companies that'll get you a higher dividend, but they're doing immoral things, then we're complicit in that. And we need to be watchful to make sure that we're not investing in those things. And we need to put our money in, 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 in good places, not in evil places that just enable the, the evil people to do evil things with the funds. So, exactly. But, but, but I mean, what I'm saying is worse than that. I agree that she should know what's going on, but you know, she's saying a blind trust. The point is, how do they have funds for narcotics money and funds for kidnapped women? I mean, it, it... well, as you as you've pointed out so many times to the listeners with the quadrillion, is it what's it up to now? Yeah, it's, keep, keep track. <laughs> it's over a thousand. It's over a thousand trillion. Talk about hush money and bribe money. I mean, they, they've got all they need to to build their bunkers, to bribe anyone and everyone. To, to forward the agenda. So really all we can do is expose these things and, and, and be good examples ourselves. Uh, I remember being told as a kid that, you know, the, the pagans would look at the Christians and at least note how they loved one another. They actually cared about one another and, and pagans who had no, you know, interest in Jesus Christ recognized that they loved one another. So uh, it's, it's not old school, you know, we should still be doing that and we should still be watching out for our neighbor uh, and and we'll, we'll survive longer if we keep an eye on our neighbor than just only on ourselves and our own pocketbook. Exactly. It's all coming to a head. And I, I know people out there watching, I don't claim to have all the answers. Uh, I, I don't even feel like I do a very good job in the final equation, but I'm doing the best I can. And I'm asking other people out there who have skills, you know, different gifts. You've got to fight this. I mean, this is getting really bad, really fast. And if you can't feel in your gut, and not just intellectually, the danger that our society's in. If you don't know how, where societies go with democide and, and wars, we, we, you think things are bad now, folks. They're about to get a lot worse. But we have a real fighting chance with good people out there like Joe Bannister uh, that are taking action and speaking up. And we, we've woken people up to a great extent. Now is the time to put that into action. Uh, Joe, it's been really great having you here with us commercial free on InfoWars Nightly News. In two minutes, closing comments or points you'd like to make. Uh, well, again, just to thank you for having me on the show, Alex. Uh, I'm a big fan. I watch very frequently. I keep up on, on the how big the octopus uh, really is. And I can't thank you enough for all that you do in that, in that department. Uh, you really help uh, to enlighten me, my family. Um, I, I think you're doing a great job. And, I, you know, just stay humble like you already are, and you'll do fine. And I would just encourage uh, all of us in America and those that are watching uh, around the world to uh, be a good example. Uh, don't, don't give up. Uh, don't be discouraged. That's uh, the evil one wants you to be discouraged. There's plenty to be uh, happy about or at least feel that you have blessings. And we just need to keep on pounding away at, at the evil. And if it comes back, that's okay. Just keep pounding away and keep shrinking it, keep shrinking it, uh, because otherwise it will just envelop all of us. And You know, and I think you just said a key here to interrupt you, because it's, it's, it's absolutely true. People say, yeah, we beat them on this land grab twice, but they just came back. That's the whole point. It's an eternal struggle between the forces of corruption, and the forces of good. This isn't, I mean, raising kids, having families. I always tell my wife, I say success is just surviving and being good people. Success mm -hmm. is trying to be a good person. It doesn't even mean we're perfect. You know, the devil will get you down, you know, and, oh, look, you did this bad thing. Oh, look, you did that. At least we have a conscience who we've really got to feel sorry for is people who don't even have one. And, and, and it's our job to get people that still have a soul 
to, to be involved, but that idea that, that we've got to beat the New World Order once and for all, like a Hollywood movie, and that it's all got to happen right away. You know, they didn't build this evil overnight. We're not going to dismantle it overnight, and we're having incredible successes. In fact, you were saying on the radio today when you popped in uh, that uh, you're seeing people that 10 years ago, agents, you know, old friends you had that made fun of you and stuff, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just to paraphrase, that, 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 that quietly they're starting to wake up. I mean, uh, can you just spend a minute or two on that? Uh, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, these these are people who aren't haven't mustered the courage to uh, speak out uh, publicly, but I've heard through uh, sources that I I have at least a quiet support, and these are people that I can only imagine from the early days in '99 when I left, that you know they thought. Well, I, I, some of them even told me in emails after I left, uh, people that I was in training with in the IRS. Uh, yeah, I've been talking to everybody, and they say, wow, Joe went off the deep end. That's what was being said in 1999. But they're not saying that uh, quite as prevalently uh, as we you know, get into 2012 and 2013. Uh, slowly but surely, everyone's ox is being gored, so to speak, and they're seeing that you're not immune if you're a federal agent. You're not immune if you're a, you know, a public official of some sort. Uh, you're not immune. They're, we are all in danger. And more and more people are realizing that. Thankfully, people in government are realizing that as well. But I, I'd like to encourage the people in government to take it up a few notches. Okay, don't you know? Be prudent with your decisions, but don't think that you don't have something to contribute well, to force back evil. Well, I agree because I, I've been reading some of the federal studies, and they had an article in the Washington Post last week where they're having hearings on Capitol Hill because. The IRS won't attack little old ladies as, as, as happily anymore to get their house and get bonuses. Uh, the Homeland Security knows that the terror thing's made up uh, predominantly. And, it, and they're calling it low morale. But what's happening is government, people in government at record rates, they were saying, just are refusing to, to, to follow these orders. And they're just doing it passively. You know, you know, the old thing of sabotage, sticking your sandal in the machine uh, that, uh, I, I mean, I showed the article earlier where they're getting rid again of the criminal investigators to go after billionaires. Well, people see that now. You know, my dad's a dentist who has a massive practice and the, the IRS headquarters for four states is right by his office. So 10% or so of his patients are IRS agents. They listen to the show. They now know what's going on. They now bring him stuff going, yeah, look, these tax-free foundations, they don't pay anything. The, uh, I, I, and so they're getting it. The little business owner going bankrupt who can't pay the taxes, their understanding isn't greedy. They see the businesses shutting down while these people controlling trillions of dollars are paying nothing and getting taxpayer money in bailouts. No, you're right. And you're also pointing out, like with your dad, I mean, the same thing goes on in my family that uh, we, we don't know. DV Kid telling, saying that on the radio back in 96, she didn't know that I was out there listening. But we, if we keep on beating that drum and we keep on talking, uh, w those results may not happen immediately or we may not even be aware of those results, but they're happening. It's percolating. It's percolating. It's percolating. It's percolating. And we need to just keep at it. And you know what your dad is experiencing, <laughs> I'm experiencing as well. I think it's happening all over the country and even over the all over the world. Amazing. Let me say bye to you here at the end of the show. I'm going to sign off. Uh, Joe Bannister, God bless you. You're a testament to liberty. And like you said, it's those ripples in the pond. Just keep getting the message out. Keep getting it out. And then people like yourself taking stands. I think it's the persecution that finally probably woke up those, the, you know, those former fellow agents. Uh, because yes. our own persecution then becomes a testament as well. Amazing. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Wow. Well, that was an extended, I don't know, almost hour-long interview with Joe Bannister. I don't know how we're ever going to cut this show down to an, uh, to an hour officially. I know we're on uh, every week for two hours uh, on a pretty big cable channel in England that's on basic cable. They just cut it all down to two hours. A lot of cable systems are already picking it up, just downloading it off prisonplanet.tv. But soon we will try to launch the official show with the uplinks and all of it. This is for subscribers and the millions that watch it uh, on YouTube and other places. And it's another blessing. People say, is it too late? The fact that I'm even on air or alive shows there's still a lot of good people out there. The fact that we're reaching so many people and having such success, even though I don't do that good of a job, is another testament to the fact that, that people are resonating with truth. They're hungry for it. 
And so all we've got to do is have the courage to stand up against this. But I've said it before, it's not even really courage. If you study history, you'd have to have crazy blind courage to not want to fight this. In fact, quite frankly, I'm just scared of this thing coming into full fruition. I'm actually, I guess it's not courage. I mean, it's self-preservation. And that's what I want people to get. It's not just a Joe Bannister or Ron Paul and Alex Jones, you know, somebody, uh, a Bob Chapman who's, who's fighting this. This is for everybody. You're only alive once. This is all happening right now. This, this life is a test. That's what it's all set up for on this planet out here in space. And, 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 and this is a test to see what you're going to do. And the enemy wants to tell you all day that that's not the case. There is no God. I've studied the globalists. They are 100% spiritual. They just worship the bad guy. All right, that's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. You want to su support us? Those of you out there watching it on the wider web, become a subscriber. 15 cents a day funds all this. There's a 15-day free trial right now running at prisonplanet.tv or infowarsnews.com. There's links at infowars.com. But make no mistake, history is happening right now. We've entered that crossroads, that jump point. Our future destiny is being decided right now. So get involved in the fight. Don't wish later that you hadn't because we can control our destiny when we take action with God's help. See you back tomorrow night. really enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and uh, well we resist them via a free market system hello my fellow info warriors alex jones here introducing you to the pro pure family of gravity fed filters now you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes fluoride lead mercury arsenic and one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non-detectable levels these poisons are gravity-fed filters and ProPure is the top of the line their filters are impregnated with silver a natural antibiotic on top of that, they're bigger, so they filter faster. You don't have to prime these the first time you use them. It's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out. But ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there that's also available and if you look at the different systems they offer the pro pure big brush finish is on a stand so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up then there's this big baby right here the pro pure king large version got a lot of different options that come with it also they have the pro pure big probably one of the best values out there and of course it's burnished stainless steel and then what i use on my my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have the glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalist obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure Gravity Filter System. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalists when it comes to your health 
and support Infowars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the New World Order. In our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at Infowars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity-fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at Infowars.com. Don't forget product code, water to save 10%. It's the latest generation, years in development. Pro Pure is the name.